Managing Violence Podcast, episode 77, with Ellis Amder. We're talking trauma, recovery, and revenge. Revenge? Yeah, check it out. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Managing Violence Podcast. I am joined today by a returning guest, uh, someone I talked to way back at the start of season two, Mr. Ellis Amder. Ellis is a well-published martial arts author. He has instructor qualifications in a number of traditional Japanese martial arts. We talked all about his background in, uh, in back in that first episode of season two uh, last year. But, uh, but Ellis is also has a professional background as a psychotherapist. He's a registered psychotherapist, a crisis intervention specialist, working with people at their lowest possible moments at times of absolute crisis. Uh, and uh, he also uh, has previously worked with uh, abused children and uh, and helped adults that were abused as children overcome their trauma. So there's uh, some really interesting conversations to be had talking to Ellis on this particular topic. Uh, Ellis was very kind and sent me a copy of his newest fiction book, which is called Lost Boy, which touches on a lot of the topics around abused children, child soldiering, refugees, uh, dealing dealing with uh, feelings of revenge and not belonging and, uh, and, and a lot of the aftermath of trauma. And it's, it's quite clearly written with real life experience. It's not a, not a purely a work of fiction. I know, I know the characters have been fictionalized and to protect the privacy of those involved, but it is an amazing read. Even for me who I don't read a lot of fiction. I really enjoyed this book because uh, there, there's so many nonfiction nuggets that I took away from, from reading it. So uh, I had a great time deconstructing it with Ellis and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy the podcast. So here he is, Mr. Ellis Amder. All right, I'm joined here at the Managing Violence podcast once again by Mr. Ellis Emder. Ellis, thanks for joining us, coming back on the show. You were back on, you were first on in uh, season two, and here we are now. Uh, we've, we've abandoned the season since we last spoke to you, <laughs> but uh, uh -huh. it's, it's been it's been a minute. It's good to have you back. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be back, Joe. All right, uh, uh, Ellis. For for those that look, if you want to know about Ellis's background, we we covered it in detail back in season two. Uh, he's through the martial arts. He's a recognized authority in Japanese martial arts, but professionally, he's also a uh, crisis intervention specialist, registered psychotherapist. He's written 17 books on de-escalation, mental health, and crisis intervention. He's written three books on classical Japanese martial arts. You may have, may have heard uh, Jeff Thompson reference them a couple of times in the interview that I did with Jeff. Uh, very well-regarded books. He's also written a graphic novel series and now two novels. So to say that Ellis is a prolific author would probably be an understatement. And uh, the topic of the day today uh, is actually based around uh, your latest fiction book. So I'm holding this up on camera for anyone who might be watching the audio uh, called Lost Boy. Now, uh, we've, we've never done a show on a fiction book previously. Uh, and and full, full disclosure, I'm, I'm not a huge fiction reader other than the odd Barry Eisler or... Uh, or Jack Reacher novel. That, that's that's about all I've I've read in the fiction world for a long time. But um, this book, I couldn't put down because obviously it's written from a place of experience. Uh, I, I won't spoil the story, but but it talks a lot about subjects like, uh, uh, well, well, basically we've got a, we've got a main character who was a lost boy uh, from Sudan, Sudan, who uh, experienced a lot of childhood childhood trauma with. His village being being killed and was displaced and ended up in camps and became uh, ended up uh, coming to the U.S. Uh, I guess as a refugee and uh, built his own career as a social worker uh, helping abused children and there's a there's a lot to unpack from that point forward. Uh, but obviously, it's built upon your own experience working with abused children uh, and and helping adults. I guess through through uh, navigating the experience of trauma. So there, there is so much in there. Even if you're not a fiction reader, there are so many things I've highlighted as like, the same way I would a, a non-fiction book. To say, oh, I need to remember that. I need to remember that. I need to remember that, which is not something I've ever done with a fiction book previously. So firstly, thank you for sending me the book. Uh, secondly, yeah. it's a fantastic read. Uh, and, it, and it's given me some insight in a way that I probably wouldn't have sat down and read a textbook on navigating childhood trauma. Uh, as much as it interests me, I, I probably wouldn't have found the time to do that. Uh, but there's some real nuggets in there. So uh, just want to, I guess, we'll, let, let's start off with, the, I guess, the origin of the book and, and the, the pro, uh, and how, how you decided to write it. Um, and just talk me through, take me through that process. Okay. Okay. Um, and 
just one thing parenthetically for those so inclined there's some really good fight scenes in the book <laughs> it's the first childhood trauma book i've ever read that's got a, a de detailed wrestling scenes it's fantastic <laughs> okay um so back in the 90s i was uh i got asked to assist uh child protective services um and what i would i'd done a presentation for them and some people were intrigued with what I had to say. And so what I was asked to do was provide what were referred to as parenting assessments. And this would be, it expanded from there, but what it, originally the idea was you had uh, parents or parental figures who had been accused of abuse or neglect, or maybe it was founded. And so the questions to be raised were, can they raise their children? should they raise their children? What would be needed to make them able to raise their children? Should they never see the children again? And in the States, as I assume Australia, this is a, a matter for the courts to decide. Mm -hmm. And um, they, part of that can be a variety of assessments, what are called psychological assessments, parenting assessments, family assessments. Um, one problem that I had with the assessments process is that most assessors profess to be scientistic. And that's a word I just made up. Um, not scientific, it's pseudoscience. And the reason it's pseudoscience is a lot of what we assert in psychology, we can't really prove in the real world because human beings are so unique. Um, but more than that, the assessment process is an interview process. And if I am dispassionate and distant and assume an objective air, that is going to evoke certain emotions in you. Just, just imagine um, any of you, uh, your, your, your child comes up to you and says, Papa or Mama, do you love me? And you go, yes, I have that affection for you, right? <laughs> That you say, well, that's an objective uh, description. That's not going to be what the child is desiring, right? That will affect the child's emotions. So the pseudo objective stance I found was dehumanizing because a person was asked to reveal or required to reveal some of the deepest, sometimes most shameful parts of themselves to a person, another person acting more or less like a cipher. And so I, and it's partly the training I went through. But I started doing um, assessments where I was fully a human being to that person. Now, I would have a dialogue. Um, I, one of the things I did, which is a crisis intervention technique, I was often dealing with very volatile people, sometimes dangerous people. And within the first five minutes, I would always give them something. I would be interacting with them. And for example, I might say, hey, um, you're a really big man. And I know you're really heated about this subject. And as best I can tell, you don't mean me harm. But with your size and the way you talk, I bet you a lot of people do. And so if you want to get your point across, maybe you don't knuckle up and lean over like you're leaning to me if you really want to establish to people that you're not a man of violence. Now, that is both a gift but it's also an assessment tool. Mm. How does this, how does this guy take um, an unafraid, kind, but direct statement? Does he puff up more? Does he say, wow, um, I hadn't thought of that. And then I see later, did he take it in or was he playing with me, right? So in other words, real humanity, a real human contact is the best assessment tool. And so I would have that kind of interaction and I was very open with people. You may really like me. You may, because you like me, and I say, I'm a likable guy, you may find yourself trusting me, but do understand anything you tell me, I'm gonna take down. And if it hurts your cause, I'm gonna take it down anyway. So whether I like you or you like me is irrelevant. Don't forget that. 
because that's only fair, right? Because I got this power and a person who is afraid of my power can reveal things that they otherwise wouldn't, right? I'm not trying to trick people. So, and I said, what I will do in my evaluation is I'm gonna have two kinds of type in my evaluation. I'm gonna have regular print. That's what I observed. That's what I'm quoting. And then I'm gonna have highlighted print. That's my opinions. So your lawyer can go through my report and say, here's Ellis's opinion and here's why we don't agree with it. To me, it seemed like the only way it was fair. Mm. And I started to get a reputation. Some people really didn't like what I was doing. Um, the, I think the best things that's happened in terms of professionally with that is four or five times people walked in with my report to the Child Protective Services office and they said, you know that guy, Ellis Amder? I hate that motherfucker more than anybody in the world. This is his report, right? And then they'd say, I hate him because everything in here is true. That's me. And I read it three times. I'm giving up custody of my kid. He's right. Wow. wow. Yeah. 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 So I felt like I was, my responsibility was to do justice to the people. Um, I was interviewing them. I had some people who were on a, a, a downward slide toward losing custody and I was able to help them turn it around. Um, I began interviewing children as well. Um, and got to know some very, very hurt children uh, in that same situation. Okay, I also made a few mistakes and I got out of that field because there were a couple times I started, I was so good that I started to become over proud of myself, overconfident. And when you get overconfident, you don't know you're making mistakes anymore. Mm. And I did over 150 cases. There were a couple that to this day, I think, uh, boy, I did that wrong. Mm. And it's easy to offload and say, well, I was one of many people, but you got to take 100% responsibility. You got to take your own weight. And I decided it was time, when I decided it was time to leave, uh, I, I left because I said, I no longer trust myself to be scared enough mm. to do things right. So I, I, I worked specifically in that area for about five years. I've done different types of crisis intervention where I've worked in varying capacities with traumatized individuals now for, oh gosh, 30 plus years. But, and this goes back to the question, which took a while, sorry, to get to it. But as I said, there were certain cases that have eaten at me that I'll never be able to make right. In addition, I had this experience several times, more than several times, when I was facing a person who could only be termed as evil, not damaged, but evil, in that whatever made them what they were, they took delight in what they did, mm -hmm. and they made it known. And so the thought would float in my mind, what am I sitting here for? Why don't I take them out? And so there are a lot of reasons why not. The glib reason is I'd rule myself out from helping other people, right? That kind of thing. Yep. Um, a philosophical reason is once you start a vendetta society, everything breaks down because everybody's got a good reason. But at its core is I was blessed in being brought up with by parents who had their issues but were fundamentally decent, kind, good human beings. And I grew up unwounded. Um, honestly, my parents in some ways were like um, Esther and Saul in that book. Mm. Um, so there was one night um, and I don't sleep all that much. I was lying in my bed and my mind is drifting, you know, thinking about all kinds of things, including old cases. And my wife is asleep beside me. And I'm just listening to her breathe. And part of me is thinking, this is heaven. 
this is this could go on forever and i'm in heaven just listening to this woman breathe and then just as happens these random thoughts float in your mind and one of these old situations came up and i just thought to myself what if i'd acted on one of those impulses and succeeded what if i'd taken somebody out what if i'd done whatever and nobody ever knew what would that do to her and me and she never knew would life just go on would it be corrupted and that was sort of the impetus for this novel the character i created those cases are you know they're altered because there's confidentiality and all that no person involved in the actual case would recognize themselves mm -hmm. but they're based on real cases every one of them every one of them and that is it, it's so apparent reading the book because the 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 details strike as so realistic uh to in a way that uh an author who hadn't lived it would really struggle to be able to to be able to describe situations as artfully and as accurately as you do in the book uh mm. it, I mean, it it's max of a memoir not not of a not of a fiction book and it's but look, I, I haven't had a fraction of the experience you've had about being around some abused children and being around um, you know, drug and alcohol abuse and mental illness and, and a few other things. The descriptions are so accurate and they, they feel so real when, when you're talking about uh, the, the kid who stabbed another kid in the leg with a pencil, as, as an example. You, you're talking about the, the snap judgment of looking at that child and knowing what his parents are like and, and ju just from the, the one second glimpse into that child's mm -hmm. life. But then also completing, there's a, the thing I like about that little section is you, you complete the narrative in your head and then the, the child throws the narrative off with the, the talk of the violin. So, I mean, for, the, for those that haven't read the book, this makes no sense whatsoever. But <laughs> the, the point is, it's uh, it's completely relatable if you've got a, if you've got a touch point with those sort of subjects. Um, the other thing that I think is really important and powerful throughout the book is it's not just about the childhood trauma of the of the characters and the uh, and the children in the book as well as the yeah you know, the, the the main character but also the the impact that wanting to help but not being able to help or being being restricted by legal boundaries or your caseload or, or whatever the, the impact that has on the, the psyche of someone who has basically dedicated their lives to helping others and then the the desire for revenge or or for vengeance and and what that does and the 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 uh the emotional impact of uh, on personal relationships based upon the the trauma or the dissatisfaction with how things are turning out at work. There's there's so many threads there that are, that are completely relatable for anyone who's been a, a, in a connected form of work. So as as I said, it really feels like I'm reading a memoir. Except I I know you're not a six foot eight African guy. Um, but for, for those that maybe listen to audio, it's a Jewish guy, but <laughs> <laughs> those that are just listening to the audio, I can verify for you that Ellis is not a six foot eight African guy. Uh, but uh, it's it, that, I think that's why I enjoyed reading it so much because it, it wasn't just a story. I could I could tell there was, there was so much of this is grounded in reality and lived experience. Yeah, and you know uh, I had so, certain people say things like, "Well, it's a catharsis," which really offends me because catharsis is a word used in therapy. You get it out of your system. It's not that at all. It's um, your life is your life. That's my life. And bad things and good things happen in one's life. And I'm doing a kind of alchemy in taking that as raw material to really through art address some issues. And the one is pain spills downhill. Mm. And it's so, common and so easy for a person who is wounded to try to heal their wounds and in the process cause more pain mm -hmm. and you know I, I can imagine some people saying this doesn't sound like a fun book <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound like a, you know what a, but there's a story here which is not like some there's there's characters in this book uh who are really fine human beings doing fine things, uh, 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 righteously fighting not to become harmful or evil and dealing with some of the worst things that people can deal with and maintaining their humanity. Uh, that's really what I was, uh, you know, sort of focused on with that. Um, 
Let's. Um, I, I've got to ask before we, before we move on to some of the actual subject matter in the, in the book. Uh, what was the um, the thought process behind uh, assigning the main character to to the Nuba people or, or you know, the people in <laughs> Africa? How, how did that come about? You know, it's funny. Um, one of my friends was worried I was going to get accused of cultural appropriation, <laughs> and and I said, I hope to God I do because that means the book's a success because enough people be talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> the reason is, I heard at Anuba 30 or 40 years ago, 40 years ago, and they just, just fascinated me. If anybody doesn't know, the Anuba are a people, um, they're not one people. There are a number of sub, not even sub clans, but different nations with different language who live in the Nuba Mountains, which is in the central part of Sudan. And um, some of them have become Muslim, some are Christian, many of them are animist. And there are two main subsections. The one center their life around wrestling. And I read one time that there's a saying that we live in the most beautiful and perfect of all worlds. And if a man does not once in his life win a wrestling match, he cannot be reborn in this beautiful world. <laughs> and, you know, wow, right? <laughs> now, the other Nuba um, are the, I don't know what they refer they, they have a similar kind of ritual fighting, which they do with wrist knives. They have these two knives that are tied to their wrist. And two men will get in an arena and they try to draw blood. And the elders, when blood is drawn, you know, usually they hit at the top of the head. When blood is drawn, one person's declared the victor. They may start with stick fighting. And if you want to get married, you got to win one of these fights. Hmm. Um, at least that's the way it used to be. So they were these fascinating people who, the way I put it in the book is just staying with wrestling. Wrestling for them was the equivalent of um, ideograms for the Chinese. In China, there are, you know, Ten, I don't know how many thousands of different peoples with different language, but they all write with the same ideogram so they can communicate, right? So you can live in the far south and be, you know, a hill tribe person in, in, in Sichuan, and you can be communicating with somebody in Manchuria. You've got the same language. So that's what binds China together as a country. Well, for the Nuba, what bound them together was wrestling. They could solve village disputes with wrestling instead of war. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, the young men had a way to channel aggression in a way that was religiously believed to make the crops grow. So they, they turned that aggression, which, you know, we, we this whole subject of podcast, managing violence, they found a way to manage violence within their own community that really um, made enhanced life. Mm. The, the Nuba have been in this terrible situation for decades between North, well, more than decades. They were raided by uh, nomadic tribes and made slaves. Uh, to this day, there's still slaves in Sudan, slave taking. Um, and then when North and South Sudan split, the Nuba are in a disputed geographical area, area I think because of oil in part. And so the war has not ended for them. So it's just just terrible situation. It's just a, a, you know at the distance that I have, um, they were they're just one of these um, people that drew me, that fascinated me, just because of, of, of the culture and the life they had, and so that's that's how the character was created uh, in my mind uh, as. Um, in part because, you know, there's this phrase, yeah, cultural appropriation. There's also cultural honoring. There is, um, you, you, you love a culture and you, through art, try to do it justice uh, and, 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 and bring it to the world. So, so that's where he came to be. Mm, mm. It was one of those, one of those topics that um, as, as I started reading through the book, it, it really connected with me because it's, it's something that, uh, yeah, look, I, I've read a, a lot uh, in, in terms of nonfiction about, about child soldiers and the the, uh, the, ter the turmoil of child soldiering in Africa and rehabilitating those kids if, if they can be rehabilitated and, 
and, and the lot the ongoing trauma that happens after these kids are, uh, you know, if they're refugees and they go to a first world country and someone's trying to actually help them like the, the challenges that are involved in that so it was it was really interesting to to have a character that was uh, well not necessarily child soldiering but um yeah on the fringe area of that yeah. was, was quite interesting uh, one of the topics that, that i really want to explore with you because it's something that we chatted about uh just privately uh, a few months back. And uh, it, it was not long actually after I, I did the interview with Jeff Thompson. And uh, mm -hmm. you, you called me and said that I, I've got a differing view on forgiveness. And uh, and I've, I find that really, really interesting. So obviously, given your background, you've worked with a lot of people that have been through some awful things. Uh, you have met and worked with and assessed some awful human beings, as well as some people that have done awful things that aren't necessarily awful human beings mm -hmm. um, i found what you had to say about forgiveness as a tool or as a recovery method really interesting uh i just want to give you a bit of a platform to, to sort of expand upon that for for the for the sake of a public audience <laughs> as, okay. as much as you as much as you're willing to <laughs> sure sure and actually jeff and i have uh uh had some correspondence about that and we intertwine it's it's not a stark difference of course yeah um but um, in my field, which roughly you could call psychotherapy, uh, there is a fair amount of talk about forgiveness. And among the reasons that people talk about forgiveness is uh, the feeling that hatred harms oneself. Uh, there are some Christian views on this, uh, and we live in uh, a Christian culture, even many of us who are not Christian by uh, you know, faith. Um, there's a, a wonderful book uh, called Sunflower by uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal. And he was in Auschwitz in a work detail. And he describes how an SS guard came up to him and said, Jew, come with me. And he brought him into an infirmary and on a bed was a Nazi covered head to toe in bandages, burned from head to toe. And the other guard left him alone with this guy. And the guy in the bed said, I'm making this short, I shoved several hundred people into a church and uh, or a synagogue and put incendiaries around it, lit it up and burned them all. And a backflash caught me, I'm going to die. I need a Jew to forgive me. <laughs> And Wiesenthal is standing there. And as I recall the story, he stood and he stood and he stood and he said, no. And he walked out. He expected somebody to be waiting for him to kill him. Mm -hmm. Nobody was there. He walked out of the infirmary, back to the ditch, picked up his shovel and started digging again. And so what he did is then he wrote this book and he asked a number of the prominent sages of our era, era um, should I have forgiven him? And there were Christians, there were Buddhists. Uh, you know, I remember Desmond Tutu was one. Uh, I don't remember, uh, Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. There were the rabbis. And what was interesting is the Christians pretty much said yes, because you know hatred is a, um, certainly not what, you know, a godly emotion. Uh, and it's damaging and perpetuates violence in the world. Um, of course, the Dalai Lama and other Buddhists were saying something similar uh, from that perspective, that these illusory emotions have to be seen through because they're an attachment to violence, et cetera, et cetera. The Jewish sages were saying essentially, it's not your right to forgive. Only God can forgive. How dare you speak for those men, women, and children who were burned to death. You weren't burned to death. It's not your right to speak. Mm. It would be only up to them to forgive, right? So with that as my basic frame, um, I frequently was taught in therapeutics that I should be trying to help people forgive their abuser. And in my particular context, I started to see this as a form of violence because what I saw was a person's rage and hatred made me uncomfortable. And I wanted, I didn't wanna be in the presence, if you will, of somebody who wanted to tear another person's face off. 
right? No matter for what reason. Mm -hmm. it's, it was just uncomfortable being with such hateful emotions, which by the way, were damaging them. Mm -hmm. But what I saw was when I suggested forgiveness, what I saw in other people was a perception, Ellis, that's for you, not for me. You want me to be the forgiving person. And so I started to approach things and I would say to people, um, when the subject came up, I'm, I'm, I don't have an agenda to help you forgive anybody. In fact, I'd like to help you get revenge. And that would stop people dead in their tracks. That's a patent, well, God, <laughs> That's a patent yeah. interruption. <laughs> yes, yes. And, you know, uh, somebody might be calling the licensing board right now. Uh, <laughs> and I would say, as far as I can see from what you told me or from what I know, this person planted a time bomb in your chest and has been ticking away, leaking poison. And one day it's going to explode. And they know that. And they're just waiting for that day. They know that even though they hurt you 40 years ago, you're still thinking about them. On some level, they know. The best revenge would be for them to know they are nothing to you. They are no more to you than walking down the street and seeing some shit on the ground and you step past it and walk on. I'd like to help you get indifferent to that. And then you move on. Mm. Now, what would happen sometimes is when a person achieved that freedom from the abuse, a sense of compassion welled up in them. Mm. They didn't ask for it, they didn't expect it. But for example, they might see what my dad did to me, somebody did to him. Mm. And there's a, there's um, I believe it's a Hasidic or Kabbalistic phrase that goes something like this. Um, the right eye of God is justice and the left eye is mercy. Justice without mercy is cruelty. Mercy without justice is weak and spineless. So true compassion, and the word compassion means being able to stand in the face of pain. To really be compassionate is to hold that abuser to whatever they need to be held for, do whatever needs to be done. And psychologically speaking, if, if that's the way it goes for you to forgive that person. Mm. Mm. But if a person says, I'll never forgive them, I don't consider that a failure. I don't consider that work to be done. I consider that that's, that's their life and they have a right to it. Mm. So I don't have, a, the, the thing I'm saying is I don't have an ideology of forgiveness. If it occurs for somebody, it's, it's grace unasked for, and that's fine. And I think there's, there's going to be a lot of people out there that are, that are listening to this that almost feel like they've failed in their recovery because they haven't reached a point where they can forgive. Yes. Uh, because someone has told them they have to forgive. Yeah. They just haven't been able to get to that point or they've, they've, they've feigned forgiveness for the sake of just getting people off their case. But internally, they're still feeling like, what's wrong with me? Why, why can't I forgive when I'm supposed to? And I think that that is such an important message that it's something that, as you said, it's grace on us for. It's something that it, if you get there, you get there, but it, it's got nothing to do with, it's no judgment on you if you don't. And if you get to a dispassionate hate <laughs> yeah. that, that doesn't distort your life, right? That you are loving to your children and loving to whoever you, you're, you're with, or you live alone in a quiet life of peace. And whenever you think of so-and-so, you hate them. That's healthy too, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't even, I don't put a hierarchy here. The question for me is damage. If your thoughts are damaging to yourself or others, there's some, something to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But if your thoughts are not damaging, who else has a right to say that one mode is better than the other? Mm -hmm. 
So to me, the question is damage and harm as more than anything else. How about, I've, I've seen, just to finish that, I mean, I've seen too many people, I've seen families say, you have to forgive me, you're hurting me. Mm-hmm. And it becomes a weapon, mm-hmm. right? So I don't see that hierarchy. Uh, if a person does forgive, um, they, w- what I'm considering healthy forgiveness, they do that from a position of power, mm-hmm. spiritual power, right? Maybe not physical power, but spiritual power. You have no hold on me, so I have the space to see what made you you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, there's so much there. I love the focus on whether it, whether it's doing damage or not. Uh, actually, back back when I was a first year psych student, I had a, a lecturer tell me that uh, the different the difference between being eccentric and being crazy is whether it brings you joy or not. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought. I remember as an 18 year old student, I thought. Hmm. I like that. <laughs> I know a few eccentric people that may be crazy objectively, but they seem to be enjoying it. So good for them. Um, I want to touch on uh, on the the topic of empathy, and mm. and in particular, empathy for abusers, and and how that I guess has manifested in you professionally. I mean, we're touching on some of the concepts of the book where we're, we've we've had people that have done some pretty awful things based upon what's been done to them, or alternatively, as you said it before, there are also people that just objectively are evil. Uh, that, that take pleasure in the discomfort and the and the, the suffering of others. How is that something that, that you've wrestled with professionally and, and in your study about what about about developing a, a, an empathetic or empathic relationship with not only the not only victims but also abusers as well? Hmm. Well, first of all, not everybody will agree with my definitions here, but let's distinguish between empathy and sympathy. Mm-hmm. Empathy is the ability to track another human being. That's all. Mm-hmm. So if I can track you, oh, you appear to be interested right now, you know, unless you're faking me out, right? Uh, <laughs> right? So empathy is tracking. So for example, a sociopath can have very good empathy. Mm. A salesman who's trying to convince you to buy a Suzuki Samurai at the used car lot can have really good empathy, right? But no sympathy. Sympathy is caring for the situation of another person. So for example, some autistic people can have impaired empathy. It's very hard for them to course to, to comprehend the motivations of another person, but they are sympathetic people. And if they do understand that for some reason, uh, um, commenting on somebody's weight hurts another person's feeling the same way it hurts their feeling when somebody moves their Darth Vader statue on their shelf. Mm-hmm. You know, once they comprehend that, they feel bad, right? So autistic people, uh, using that term very broadly, um, can be clueless in terms of tracking other people, but kind. A sociopath can be great at tracking in a predatory way, have great empathy in a way, but no sympathy. So um, as to your question, I had a mentor and he presented to me a concept he called the undamaged self. And the undamaged self is pretty much whoever you are, whatever you may be, there is somewhere in you a capacity for compassion. Now, what I have found is there are people who either had it murdered or murdered it themselves because it was painful to have that compassion, you know, doing what they did or living the way they lived. So they succeeded in murdering that and then they became pirates would be one way to think of it because there's nobody more free than a pirate. That's why we like them, right? (laughs) Um, In fiction, they're wonderful. In fact, right? They're rapists, murderers, murderers, all that. So what I learned from my mentor was you speak to the undamaged self. I'm tracking the person, but I'm going to arbitrarily have the faith that there's a person of decency, somebody there without lowering my guard. Okay. So there's no sense. Therefore, I'm going to open my arms and you wouldn't stab me because I'm a nice guy. No, I want to be, I want to have perfect zanshin using the Japanese martial art term of, you know, mindful awareness. But at the same time, I can be empathetic, I can track them, and I can still be sympathetic to their plight. 
And the other reason this became important to me in terms of your direct question is, shall I say this became a weapon? Mm -hmm. Because my compassion was genuine, my zanshin was solid, and I had people confess crimes to me that they had never confessed, even though they knew in confessing to me that I was going to get them in, you know, mm. arrested or whatever. And the reason was there was a part of them that said, at least once in my life, I want to be seen for who I am by a human being who treats me with respect regardless. Yeah, wow. Wow. There's now, a... Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that a, a, a phrase just popped into my head when you when you were talking about uh, using empathy. The, the, it feels like a title to another book, Weaponized Empathy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then the question comes up, at what point does this become sociopathic, right? At what point am I just being manipulative, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so... <sighs> It's like, to me, it's like anything else. If you're a security professional, is there a day that you're, you say, well, I'm not going to check to see if my taser is actually, the battery is actually good. I'm not going to check if I've actually got my extra mags as I go out, whatever your weaponry is. Uh, you know, I checked my back yesterday when I walked in this building. Why do I have to do it today, right? Is that something you complain about or you just do, right? So similarly, it seems to me, even though in, in this realm that I'm in, every day I have to ruthlessly check myself to see, am I clean? Where I got out of the direct, that assessment field I was talking about before is I did, no longer trusted myself to be clean for various reasons. I was having so many successes, to be honest, that I started, I lost the ability to say, am I really successful? Or am I just really convincing? So I had to be honest, I can't really do that work. Yeah. Actually, interesting parallel, uh, when I was uh, having a bit of a career crisis as a, as a young man, and I was considering changing degrees and going into law, uh, mostly because law seemed like it had good money. Uh, but uh, I, was, I was considering that, and, uh, but, but part of me, I guess I've always had that sort of protector instinct, and I was considering going into family law. And uh, a family lawyer that I happened to know, he said to me, you, you won't last. And I, and I said, well, I, I mean, I was like 19 years old, right? So I took it personally. Like, what do you mean I won't last? Like, oh, I, I can, I can do this. Like, I'm smarter than you. But I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said you care too much. And uh, and he said, if you do this job well, the way it should be done, uh, you you won't last more than seven to ten years. And, and and you'll hate everyone. You'll hate everything, and it will damage every personal relationship you have because you'll have your heart broken over and over. And that was the thing that uh, in in the, in the early stages of, of uh, Lost Boy, uh, where uh, Essam's uh, mentor is his his uh, his boss says you're not a social worker until you've had your heart broken, and that that brought back that conversation so vividly for me. And obviously, I didn't go down that path. Um, I, I realized that you know there was there was validity in what I was being told, but. We we I think we we underestimate, or at least if you're outside the profession, you don't realize that the people who do the job well tend to be the most impacted by doing the job um, because yeah. you, that human connection is so, so volatile, but also you're so vulnerable. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, if you care too much, as you just said, but as you care too much, you won't be able to do the job. Well, mm. I'll, I'll give you a kind of, to me, it's a funny example. Some people don't, but uh, there's a case manager working in, in a very high intensity unit where they're trying to keep very seriously mentally ill people out of the hospital. And so there was this one guy that was on this person's caseload, a very gentle soul, suffering from schizophrenia. And they put him in a apartment down, down downtown and uh, local prostitutes got to know him and they knew they could push him around. So they, when they would get a John, they would just bring the John up to his room, knock on the door, he'd say, hi, and they push him out of the way, go in his bed, have sex, and then leave. <laughs> and the case manager um, heard about this and was furious. Now, I, I would think to most of my listeners, you know how you handle this. How the case manager handled it was, he hid in the closet. <laughs> and when, 
<laughs> when the prostitute and the John were knocking boots, he jumps out, grabs the two, his big guy, grabs the two of them <laughs> in their semi-closed state and drags them outside and throws them into the street. <laughs> And, you know, on one level, I, I mean, it's a funny story. Uh, he could have gotten killed. Yeah. And worse than that, he could. And here's the thing. Worse than that, he could have got his client killed in his righteous. Mm -hmm. And he cared a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. But that, I think that's an example of what happens. It's a pretty grotesque example. But <laughs> when people when people care too much. Um, somebody gets hurt. Because the the realization where you hit somebody's got to do something i can't let this go on i'm responsible and there you are if you stay within the rules it's help you're helpless right so finding that balance between the the rules and what feels ethical uh yeah uh, it's uh I mean, there's there's a very painful example in the in the early parts of the book where uh esam is re having to return a girl to a to his, her father whom he knows rapes her um uh, mm -hmm. but he's powerless to do anything else about it and and the the vivid description of waiting outside the window and knowing what is happening and yeah. and feeling completely i guess emasculated and a bit the having the it, all the righteous indignation, but also still feeling powerless because, as you said um, earlier, if you act upon those emotions, then you lose your ability to help anyone else. Uh, and and obviously, I mean, it's a slippery slope by the time you go into uh, the field of vengeance. Yeah, uh, and 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 again, without doing too many spoilers, hmm. if you do act, is it really going to make things better? Mm -hmm. And so often, it's not. Um, there's this moment where it's kind of physical virtue signaling. Well, I did the right thing. I wouldn't let, and, and then you look at the ashes of the house mm. burned around you. You know, it, it, it's, it's a terrible, anybody who's involved in policing and security in any way where you have taken responsibility to protect other people, you will find yourself helpless you will find situations where you can't make it right. Now, does that drive you out of the profession? Are you able to, so to speak, triage and say, I couldn't help that one, but there are many other people I can help and I learned from this or whatever. Um, there's a level of anybody who stays in this field where you have to cut your losses. Mm. And that's very hard to accept. You know, there's a thing that I hear way too often and it might even be evoked by this book. And it starts with, if anybody touched my child, I'd, mm -hmm. okay. And I, I wanna say to people that this is something, uh, it's shut the fuck up about that. Perhaps could be more polite. I've been using more philosophical terms. Here's why. Number one, um, there are certain things that if you speak of them, you call, you call the devil to you, in my opinion. You shouldn't talk about that way about your own child, imagining something like that happening. Rather, you imagine the possibility that such people exist and you make your child strong so it won't. Um, my younger son, uh, somebody tried to kidnap him when he was four and a half years old and he bit himself free. Okay, um, Because I taught him even at that age, how to protect himself. And he found the strength in him to bite free. Mm. Um, the other thing is, if people say this, and I've, I've just heard too many people say this, even around their own kids, mm. and they think they're being protective. But God forbid, what would happen if your child was hurt? And there were very good reasons that you didn't do it. Mm. Like you realize, what's going to keep my child whole is she or he needs me in their life. And if I go to prison, feeling righteous. And, but what's that do to your child? Your child said, wait a second, Papa or Mama promised. And now they're not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just, I just started thinking about this, that, that, that this discourse, I think any parent, any uncle, any aunt, whoever, 
your responsibility is to help your child be a resilient, powerful child um, who is able to speak for themselves and that you are the kind of adult that your child will come to. One of, one of the most chilling studies I read uh, about school shooting is I think it was, I forget the exact number, it was something like 70 to 80% of the school shooters, kids, told somebody else they were going to do it. Not one of them told an adult. Yep. So if there is this alienation between parents and children, adults and kids, it seems to me to help keep our kids safe, we need to do some more consideration about how do we remain accessible to our kids? And to me, one of the best ways to do this is when you teach your child how to be strong, which comes down to self-defense and martial arts and speaking up for yourself and all those. And you do it in a way that the child enjoys being with you and doesn't feel beat down. If something troublesome is happening, your child comes to you and then you can protect them. Yeah. And I think that's a lot more valuable than pronouncements. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to do anything that gives your child something extra to feel guilty about. Right. I mean, that, when that child's processing that trauma, it's going to be a hell of a lot harder if he's also thinking about the trauma of, well, if I hadn't been in that position, then dad wouldn't be in jail or, you know, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. yeah, my little sister wouldn't be so traumatized because she grew up without dad. And like, there's, there's so much else. The, the secondary and tertiary consequences of us acting upon rage um, can have. So, yeah, uh, it's. And such an important topic that I don't think gets enough air. I don't think we talk about this enough. Um, it's it's too easy to to focus on the you know being the hero uh, and and being able to save the world and 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 yes we need to we need to shine light and celebrate the heroes as they as they happen. But we we sometimes neglect the quiet suffering of those that that would like to be heroes but can't uh, mm -hmm. and uh, or or shouldn't. It, even worse. It's, uh, so look, we, we are we are coming up on time, uh, and uh, I think we'll we'll say we'll save more for a future episode. But the the book that we've been referencing is Lost Boy uh, by Alice Amder. It's available on Amazon. It's available on your website, edgework.info. Is that correct? Is it yes? Um, it's uh, edgeworkbooks.com. Oh, sorry, edge, edgeworkbooks.com. So edgeworkinfo is the is the other side. Uh, so edgeworkbooks.com. Uh, I'll put a I'll put a link in the show notes as well for anyone who wants to click on that and purchase it straight away. Even if you're not an avid fi fiction reader, uh, it is well worth picking up if you're interested in some of the, the topics we've talked about. If you are an avid fiction reader, you'll really enjoy it as well. Uh, so Ellis, thank you very much for your time. You're going to stick around and do some bonus questions with us in just a minute. But for everyone who's leaving us here. Thank you very much, Mr. Ellis Amder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again to Mr. Ellis Amder for being so generous with his time and obviously also for sending me a copy of the book, uh, which gave me an opportunity to read it and to be able to deconstruct it and to be able to have this conversation with him. So thank you, Ellis. One thing we are going to start doing uh, each episode now, at the, at the end of each episode, I'm going to have a book of the week. I read a ton of literature when it comes to violence, aggression, trauma, recovery, psychology, behavioral profiling, threat assessment, the works, right? I, I read on this topic all the time. It's my profession. It's what I do. I want to make sure that I'm continually offering the absolute best to myself and the best knowledge out there to my clients. So I'm constantly reading, which means I'm often asked for recommendations. So uh, other than obviously picking up Ellis's work, uh, so I, I'd recommend as a starting point, if you want to know more about the topic we just talked about, pick up Lost Boy. It is a, it is a work of fiction, but as I said, there's a lot of value in it. Also pick up Words of Power. Words of Power is a fantastic fantastic de-escalation book. It shaped a lot of how I approach verbal de-escalation training. And, uh, and Ellis has written an amazing work there with words of power. He also has a ton of other books on that subject. But st sticking with the communication theme, uh, one that I would highly recommend, it's on most bookshelves everywhere in the world at the moment, is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Uh, I've listened to it on audio. I have it as an ebook, and I've just purchased it for a third time now uh, in the hard copy as well. Uh, obviously, I'm not, not sponsored by, by Black Swan or Chris Voss, but uh, it is an amazing book. If you want to learn how to negotiate from a person who negotiated the release of hostages, uh, then you will uh, you'll enjoy that book. It's not just about negotiating and release, releases of hostages. It's about getting a good deal. It's about winning people over. It's about building rapport. It's about building trust. It's about all these things that can actually have a direct impact on the quality of your relationships, the quality of the people that you're around. And, and uh, you, you never know, the skills may come in handy to get you out of violence or out of a threatening situation if you were to find yourself in one. So pick up Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. The links to Ellis's books as well as the link to Never Split the Difference will be in the show notes. 
or in the video description if you're watching this on YouTube. All right, that is it for me for this week. Make sure you don't go anywhere because next week I'm going to be joined by the one and only Lee Morrison. That's right, Lee Morrison from Urban Combatives is coming back and he's going to be talking about uh, his Tier 1 civilian program and also his Path to the Peaceful Warrior program. Make sure you check that out. That'll be next week. I'll talk to you next time.